Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us here today. This is going to take a few minutes because it was a very large operation, but I want to start by introducing you to some of our colleagues that joined us this time with this operation. We could not do this without our counselors, so I want to start with them. One more child, Jody uh, Domingue, Heartland for Children, Caden Parchment, and Saleya Freedom, Sarah Batchelder. In addition to that, this operation was on the west side of the county in the city of Lakeland, and we were assisted by several police departments. A special thanks goes to the Lakeland Police Department. We have Assistant Chief Pacheco here with us today. They donated a lot of resources for us this time, and it's really appreciative. It, the, the, and the support by all of these police departments was over the top. Hand City Police Departments represented today by Detective uh, Domenez, Davenport, Chief Steve Parker's with us. We also have the Auburndale Police Department with us, uh, Detective Kevin Seymour, Lake Hamilton Chief Mike Teague, and the Winter Haven Fire Rescue was with us, Hunter Hart. And that wasn't just if things got real hot, they'd put the fire out, but I imagine they would have if it had have happened. But it's important to point out that in this county, we don't operate in silos as separate law enforcement agencies. We're all friends. We all respect and, and, and love each other, and we all work together. And you're going to see the outcome when you have great police agencies that work with you. I'm going to give you a lot of information quickly, and then the reporters can narrow in on whatever they're interested in. 228 arrests, 66 prostitutes, 50 Johns, and 12 others. This time we identified 13 potential victims of human trafficking. But I want to make this statement today. In one year, we have identified 58 potential victims of human trafficking in one year with these operations. What's significant about that? That is the most ever we've been able to identify. And why were we able to identify this many potential victims of human trafficking? Because of these ladies that's standing with us. We do something that most police agencies run from if they do these kinds of operations at all. We embed our counselors with us from the absolute very beginning of the operation even before. They are every bit as important to our investigation as our detectives that go undercover and have many times risked their lives. So I want to once again thank our social service organizations for joining us from the beginning. <clears throat> 42 of the 228 that we arrested were from Polk County. Now those of you from Polk County know better. We talk about this, we don't hide it, and if you don't know about it, you obviously live under a rock. So you had to learn the hard way. But for the rest of you, pay attention, because this is not the last operation. We'll have more, and we'll give you the opportunity to be arrested if you're stupid enough to show up. That's a guarantee. In addition to that, 42 of these folks were married. And I've got some quotes from wives that I'll give you in a little bit. And some people say, well, this is not a big deal, but at the end of this operation, I'm going to talk about the 21 illegal aliens we arrested in much more detail. Criminal charges. Oh, it's a low-level <coughs> misdemeanor, and these aren't violent people. These people had a previous history of 2,038 arrests. Did you hear what I said? These people are criminals in their own right, most of them, not all of them. 879 previous felonies, 1,159 previous misdemeanors. We dealt with 17 firearms this time by 15 different suspects. 44 people brought narcotics. 12 people came and had outstanding warrants. We appreciate that. They came to us. We didn't have to chase them down. One was a commercial pilot. 
we had all branches of, we had a branch of the military in teachers, and I'm going to talk specifically about those in a minute. But the comments. One wife sent the detective a message the next day. She said, good one, guys. Thank you for helping me in my marriage. Keep doing what you're doing. One John said he worked overtime today, and he just needed to blow off some steam. Well, we gave him a chance to also cool his heels in the county jail. Another one said, well, I came here because, you know, I'm going to be incapacitated for 10 days. i got to turn myself in Monday at the county jail for 10 days. The judge sentenced me to previously. Wait, you don't have to turn yourself in. We're going to give you a ride and some additional criminal charges to go through it. One John, John's, who was married, said, well, sometimes you just need to see something different. Well, he did. He saw a different woman, but she was undercover. Then he got to see the jail. I would hate to see what it's like at his house when his... By the way, in January of this year, he was arrested in Hillsborough County for what? The same thing. He's married, but his wife's proud of him. Two arrests in two counties in Central Florida. I don't know if this gets to New York City or not, but we'll put it on social media and she'll have all options. Benjamin Johnson, he's from Plant City. He's a golf pro. He's also an athlete at Eagle Brook in Lakeland. That's right. He's PGA specialized teacher and coach. And he came for sex with a female, 150 bucks. He has a criminal history of, of uh, cannabis and dealing in stolen property. So he can teach you to play golf or he can teach you how to deal in stolen property or how to get caught at dealing in stolen property. Then there's Wilman Santa Cruz not to be confused with Santa Claus, he's 50. He says he's a triathlon coach, a certified triathlon coach, and he's a triathlon athlete. You know what's strange about this? The dude showed up with meth. I mean, does that help you perform better when you're a triathlon athlete? Or do triathlon athletes, who you would think would be the kind of people who took care of their body, was using meth and seeking out the interest of a lady of the evening. Then there's Sergio Collins. He currently is a pro progressive insurance claim adjuster, but he's married. I bet his wife's not happy. And he says on his LinkedIn page that he's a middle school football coach at Lakeland Christian School, they said, no way he is not a coach at Lakeland Christian Schools. So when you're doing your press, don't look him up online and take Sergio at his word. The school says, absolutely not. He thought he was going to have come have sex. But then, of course, if you're going to have coaches and teachers, you might as well have a straight up teacher. This is Gene Ahume. He's 26 from Auburndale. He's a teacher at New Beginnings High School where he teaches math and science. He came to have sex. He called it a quick visit for $60. Well, since he's able to teach math, he can figure out that it didn't add up when he came to this time. Then Brandy Barnes. She's an IT specialist at Tampa General Hospital. We're going to get to the medical world for a minute. You know, we did the coaches, we did the teachers. She has a criminal history of meth arrest, and she provide, she agreed to provide sex to an undercover for one hour. Okay. Then this is Luxon Jean Brinville. He's 38. 
he's married. He's in the medical affair. He's the RN, a registered nurse at Manatee Springs Nursing Home. He wanted to have sex. He has a criminal history of DUI. So <clears throat> you can still work as an RN if you get drunk and drive. I'm interested to see if they're going to do anything to his license for a morals act of having or trying to have sex. We'll find out. Louis Navarro, he's from Puerto Rico. He's 61. He's a veterinarian. He's retired from the USDA. He came over to have sex, but his veterinarian license is still current. Maybe I can talk the judge into putting him in the county jail because we always need help with spay and neuters at animal control. This is Tracon Giles. He's from Tampa. We're going to the military now. He's a staff sergeant in the Air Force. He came for sex. And he said, well, he's done this before about six months ago. Uh, he doesn't learn very fast. Can't believe the Air Force would have a slow learner, but I guess they do. And then there's Jaden Hall. He's 19. He's scheduled to begin his Air Force training in May. And oh my goodness, he had a meltdown. This can't happen to me. This can't happen to me. I'm going into the Air Force. Well, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Who knows? And then there's Brandon Bush. He's active Air Force as well. Air Force was the only branch of the service we taught this, or, or Air Force wannabes. He's scheduled at McDill. He's an airman first class. He's not only in the military, but he's a military police officer. So since we talked about military and he's a military police officer, let's get to our law enforcement officer. Y'all Kusi, he's 23. He used to be a detention deputy for me. We fired him when he was arrested in Orange County on February the 9th. No, I take that back. He resigned before we got around to firing him. And then he, we arrested him again on February the 23rd. So on the 9th, he got arrested in Orange County and resigned. On the 23rd, we arrested him again. And he said, hey, is this a felony now that I'm arrested the second time? He didn't pay attention in the police academy because he hasn't been convicted yet. So why we were interviewing him and we go like dude what are you doing you went from being a stellar employee to committing morals crimes and it's two in a month he said I got a problem no kidding you got a big problem then there's Alex, uh, Alex Everett he's 34 he says he's on disability he doesn't work <clears throat> so that we're paying him to do things like have sex. He called it a quick visit. In his car, we found cocaine, fentanyl, cannabis, a gun. He picked up an armed trafficking in cocaine and fentanyl charge in addition to his misdemeanor soliciting charge. Oh, he's got a criminal history of robbery, fleeing, armed trafficking, and he spent eight and a half years in prison for some of those violent things. He says he's on disability. He's not disabled, folks. He's able to commit crime. And if you're able to commit crime, you ought to be able to go to work. He just doesn't like to work, obviously. And then there's Joseph DeBello. He's 46. He's from Wildwood. He's married. He's a plumber. He also said, let me see if I can find it here. He also said that... Uh, He's a pagan. He's a member of an outlaw motorcycle group. Now, he said a lot of things, you know. He, they said he, by the way, he was super nice. He's a relatively new member of the pagans. And he explained all of this. He was very proud of his outfit. They call it colors. See, we asked him about this. And he said, well, because I have this safety pin here, we thought maybe it was for big underwear or something. He said, when you have it like this, you're sending a message to all the other different motorcycle gangs that you're just passing through and you're peaceful and you don't want any problem. So he had his diaper pin 
walked in, so he didn't want any problems, but he got problems. But he told our undercover, you see, there's rules about this jacket. The rule is that, well, no one is supposed to touch this jacket, okay? But remember, you see, no one. And you must turn the jacket inside out to hang it up. We chose not to do that, too, why we're not touching it. He said that his wife was going to really be mad, and he used other words. Well, we called her, and guess what? He was right. She was really mad. And I bet the pagans were really mad, because, see, he's not been a member but just a few months, and here now he's disparaged them, and the cops have one of their jackets, and they've been handling it, and you know, we didn't hang it up backwards or any of the other rules that they have, but hey, Joseph, I don't know how well you, you, you do plumbing business, but you don't do very well at following the rules with your outlaw motorcycle gang. I'm going to go over this really quick. These two guys are brothers, Omar 16, Caleb 17. They came down from Wesley Chapel, which is in Pasco County, and guess what? They came down to rob us at 16 and 17. We saw them slinking in the hallway, listening through the door. They tried to, they set up the deal, but it just wasn't right. They were dressed all in black. They had their face covered. And when we took them down at their car, they had a BB gun that looked like a real gun. That could have gone really bad for them, but instead they're just charged with soliciting and, um, and a bunch of other stuff. Oh, by the way, they have a criminal history for burglary and larceny out of Hillsborough County just recently. They're juveniles. We're going to see how the system deals with them to get them in line so they don't end up with the rest of their life ruined. But before I turn it over to my colleagues here, they worked with us to make this happen. And what this is, and I want everybody to see it clearly, federal policy drives illegal immigrant crime and victimization. And that's the focus, other than our victims of human trafficking. Listen, folks, I want to introduce you to Andres Gill, okay? Here's this guy. He's also on this board, but get a look at him for a second. He came down here from New York with three females. All of them are in the country illegally. Did you hear what I said? They're all here illegally. He's the one that comes with them to drive them. These ladies are all controlled by a human trafficker. We think their human trafficker is a female. She sets up their appointments, she puts their ads online, she tells them where to go. And by the way, on Friday, the, the victims of human trafficking, and we've grayed them out, three of them that are here illegally from Venezuela, three of them have to pay her three thousand dollars a piece on Friday or else they're threatened so they're not free they're really indentured and they're quote unquote paying off their debt now here's what they told us all right I'm sure the federal government will verify that this is not true but you decide who you want to believe whether you want to believe these victims of human trafficking are the whitewash the federal authorities give you. They said that when they came into the country illegally, DHS gave them a form, an ID, paperwork, that allows them to fly for free. You know, Southwest would let your bags fly free. Well, the federal government will let your illegal immigrants fly free. And they operate out of New York. And they were working 
up there, and the New York authorities said, hey, if you don't have identification, you can't work in our sex trade up here. You know, we don't allow sex trade here at all, but New York will allow you to do some stuff if you've got the proper authority. So they say they make a lot of money. They're addicted to it. These ladies are going to give you more details. They tell us that they fly to major metro centers for free on the federal government where they set up their appointments for sex all around the country. Did you hear what I said? Listen, folks. If they don't pay $3,000 apiece on Friday, they're in trouble. The human trafficker sets up the deal. Hey, this deal is just outside of Tampa. They say they show this ID, this card, this paper, and they fly for free down here. Then they fly back. But we heard a similar theme from all 21 of these folks. We can't work legally. We're addicted to this cash. It's a lot of cash, and it's quick, so we have to give 3000 a week. We get to keep everything above that. We have a crisis at the border. And because of the crisis at the border, we have people that are victimizing illegal folks, forcing them into the sex trade because we allow these criminals in the country illegally. We all rail about this, and nobody pays any attention. And then we want to politic everything. Oh, we had a good piece of legislation that limited the average to only 5,000 illegals a day in the country, and then we can shut it off. Well, if you can shut it off at 5,000 people illegally coming in this country a day, you can shut it off at no people illegally coming in this country a day. But the politicians are politicking while the victims are being victimized. I read an article this week that says, well, the illegals coming here aren't committing crime at any greater percentage than the people who are here legally. What they didn't tell you is if they weren't here illegally at all, the crime they would commit here would be zero. So we're being victimized. But that doesn't make any attempt difference on the national level. You see, because they set up there behind their gated communities and, and in Congress, and they play politics back and forth between the two parties, while illegals are victimized, citizens are victimized, children are victimized, and you've got this goofy-looking kid here who's making sure that they come up with $3,000 a week apiece, and he's here illegally. It's a mess, and it doesn't have to be. If we can deal with it and catch it on the local level, they can stop it on the federal level. Shame on all of them, every one of them, for not getting together and saying, you know, there are things bigger in this country than my individual politics. So now, we'll start with Jody. Jody, come on up. Good morning. My name is Jody Domingue, and I'm the executive director of anti-trafficking at One More Child. We would like to thank Sheriff Judd, the Polk County Sheriff's detectives, and the various agencies that are represented here today for their continued partnership and for the ability to affect those who are being um, impacted by commercial sexual exploitation at their most critical moments. One More Child has been serving vulnerable children and families for the last 120 years. Last year, we served over 250,000 individuals. 776 of those were survivors of human sex trafficking that we served in Florida, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Ohio. We walked alongside these individuals with survivor mentorship, advocacy, and mental health counseling. Several of the survivors that we came alongside of came from operations just like this one, including Amber, we met Amber at the last Polk County Sheriff's uh, operation. And all, all, although Amber wasn't ready to disclose her victimization, she was ready to receive help. 
Um, and we were able to wrap around Am Amber with advocacy with her criminal court case and provide her necessary resources that began her path and journey to healing. As a result of this, we were also able to help Amber identify a local church that was, she was able to plug into for her forever community. And now she's got a hope for her future. During this operation, we provided follow-up services to 62 individuals who came to be purchased for sex. We met with over 23 women while they were incarcerated to let them know that they had better options, that there were resources out there for them that could lead for their healing and for them to be self-sufficient on their own. We also uh, helped identify as many as 14 potential victims of human trafficking who now have ongoing uh, investigations. I will say with all of this great work in this operation, there were a lot of people who were arrested for purchasing sex, coming to purchase sex. And the sheriff has asked us to address that this is a significant problem that must be addressed at all levels. Lucky for us, we were in the rooms embedded during these investigations, so not only are we able to present those that are vulnerable with necessary resources, but we're also able to provide education to the buyers that what they're doing is not a uh, act between two consensual adults that people on the other side of that transaction are being victimized time and time again. And we are begging, employing for our uh, advocates around the state to utilize the resources at their disposal, including the state's attorney's office to make sure that we are implementing the fines associated with buying uh, uh, commercial sex. And also that we're utilizing registries that we have. The Polk County Sheriff's Office is one of the very few that utilizes those types of resources. And we're, we are asking that other advocates around the state do the same as well. Now, none of this great work could have been possible without our expert team. We dedicated a total of team members, including advocates, mental health therapists, and lived experience experts who were embedded during this operation on the very night of the operation happening, and then also did immediate follow-up visits afterwards with every individual we encountered that we could. I would like to introduce you to one of our lived experience experts, Stacy Ham. Stacy had a pivotal role in leadership during this operation, and we are grateful that she utilized both her lived experience as well as her expertise in providing support to those who have been affected by commercial sexual exploitation. Good morning. My name is Stacy Ham, and I am here today as a survivor leader and mentor with One More Child Anti-Trafficking Mobile Team. I'm honored to stand here today with the Polk County Sheriff's Office and so many am amazing organizations who are continuously fighting for our survivors to be seen and heard. I can tell you that human trafficking is very rarely what we often see in movies, social media, and online. It often depicts children being kidnapped, held in cages, taken against their will, teens being stalked at stores or when they leave schools. While this may happen, this is not the case in the majority of our trafficking victims here in the US, and this can sometimes lead to our victims being misidentified. As a survivor of human trafficking, I grew up with my exploiters and my traffickers. I was born into a multi-generational cycle of familial trafficking where I began being exploited and sold for sex by the age of two. What I've learned throughout my trafficking experience and for my brother and sister survivors is that so many of us have personally known our survivor, our, uh, personally known our traffickers. Many of us develop relationships with our traffickers and many of us have felt a sense of belonging with our traffickers. I can tell you many traffickers are men, women, boyfriends, girlfriends, family members, pimps, and people that we are meeting online all who are using grooming tactics to prey on our vulnerabilities. Any race, age, and gender can become susceptible to being targeted for human trafficking. It typically takes an average of eight to 10 points of contact for someone to feel comfortable to come forward and speak on behalf of being a survivor or a victim of human trafficking. And I can tell you this is true. Throughout my life, I've had so many amazing people pouring into me, encouraging me to speak of my experiences and to seek healing for my recovery of human trafficking. I've had amazing mentors who have taught me great life skills and therapists that have helped me process the trauma that I endured. 
I stand here today as a survivor of human trafficking to share there is light and that there is hope at the end of the tunnel. To any survivor that is out there listening right now, I want you to know that all of us, we see you and we hear you, and we have teams of experts here ready to meet and serve you 24-7. We are ready to come alongside you towards your hope, your healing, and your restoration. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Katie Parchment. I'm the co-chair for the Human Trafficking Task Force for Polk Highlands and Hardy Counties as well as the Resiliency Coordinator with Heartland for Children. Heartland for Children is the lead community-based care agency under the Department of Children and Families that oversees the child welfare system for Polk Highlands and Hardy Counties. On behalf of Heartland for Children, I would like to extend a warm thank you to Sheriff Judd and all the law enforcement personnel standing behind me. The strong partnership between the Sheriff Department, Heartland for Children, and the other NGOs allows us to be on the ground floor of engagement with potential human trafficking victims to provide them with the immediate resources and help that they need. That's unique to this area. Other areas don't give that opportunity for NGOs to be right there on the ground floor to really pour into people who are being victimized in that moment. So we thank you and appreciate that. This operation continues to be an outstanding example of collaboration, compassion, and community engagement. Each and every law enforcement officer, detention deputy, and volunteer operated in grace and professionalism, and we appreciate it. During the course of the eight days, we were given the opportunity to engage with and get to know every individual that came through the door. I would like to thank them for being open to speaking to us about their current circumstances, engaging in discussions about human trafficking, weighing out the implications and safety concerns of being in the life, and briefly unpacking the trauma associated with it. We were also able to discuss what adverse childhood experiences are and obtain a few attendee scores. Several of the people who completed the ACEs screening had a score of four or more, which is considered a high ACEs score and ind indicative of a history of trauma. Not only were we given the opportunity to speak to potential human trafficking victims, we were also able to educate the buyers on the role they play in the cycle of abuse and trauma that may have endured over years. There was one common thread that was quite evident when speaking with the women in the life, and that was resiliency. I would encourage you to continue to build on that resiliency and reach out to our partners for help. Hope Florida is a free program that is designed to help individuals uh, work through barriers for, for um, self-sufficiency and community resources. With the help of resource navigators, we are committed to staying engaged with families beyond the first phone call. If you need help, contact Hope Florida at 850-300-HOPE. United Way of Central Florida 211 hotline is a 24-hour, seven days a week resource de dedicated to helping people find community resources and local programs um, that helps with everything from everyday basic needs to more complicated necessities. And then findhelp.org is a free comprehensive website with a variety of resources and providers that are unique to the area in which the users live. These are just three among many outstanding programs that are doing the work in our communities. Please take advantage of these free resources to help strengthen your resiliency and respond and reposition your life to a sustainable and safe occupation. In closing, please remember, and I'm speaking to anybody who may be in the life or may be tra being trafficked, that you are more than your current circumstances. You are loved, you are wanted, and you have an amazing testimony ahead of you, but seek the help because we are here to help. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Batchelder, and I am an advocate with Sale of Freedom. Uh, like many of these ladies said, when we meet individuals who are being trafficked during these operations or through other means, they don't always often raise their hand and say, I'm a victim of human trafficking. It takes many different encounters for them to feel comfortable enough to share that or even to understand that that's actually what's happening to them. So if you are out there and um, you feel that you may be being victimized, please reach out. Sale of Freedom offers safe homes. We offer therapy. We assist people in attending court hearings where they're able to testify against their traffickers. And we can be reached at 1-888-FREE-ME. 
morning, uh, Assistant Chief Pacheco with the Lakeland Police Department. Um, just want to thank Sheriff Judd and all of his team and uh, my team that participated in this operation. Uh, what's disturbing to me is that this was just one operation um, and look at how many people we arrested and how many victims of human trafficking that we identified. Um, what happens on the other 364 days a year that we're all driving around our city and our county and what's happening right underneath our noses. So there are tons and tons of victims out there who we have yet to identify. Um, and it's only through these operations that we're able to at least identify some who we're able to help. So from our agency, from the Lakeland Police Department, we're proud to partner with all these other agencies uh, to be a part of these operations and we'll continue to do so uh, as long as there's a need to do so. Thank you. Good morning, Steve Parker, the Chief of Police for the City of Davenport. And and the Davenport Police Department, and I've said it before and I'll continue to say it, you know, we stand alongside with Sheriff Judd and, and the rest of these other law enforcement agencies in these kind of operations. I mean, it's you can look at the numbers and tell it's a, it's a needed task. It's, it's something that needs to be done. And, you know, in Polk County, we are blessed to have um, law enforcement agencies that work well with each other. We have that great partnership. But I think what's important in these operations to note is the, the collaboration and the partnership we have with these organizations behind us. You know, it's without them that we, we don't see the, the after effects. We don't see the, the hard work that goes into um, helping these victims get out of these kind of uh, scenarios. And I think, to, for me, I think that is, that's the key to these operations, identifying them and getting that help that, that they need afterwards. And that's where these ladies come in at. And again, I just want to say thank you to Sheriff Judd and to our partners here for uh, all the work that we did this past week. Thank you. Now what happens is we gather all these cases together and we send them to the state attorney's office. And we're fortunate in this state to have Brian Haas as our state attorney. He is simply outstanding. His team is outstanding. He gets it. He gets the 30,000 foot picture. He gets the ground picture. He is an advocate for the victims and he's gonna prosecute the suspects to the fullest extent of the law for which I'm grateful. But with that, do you have questions of any of us? So within the span of a year, you were able to arrest, or excuse me, rescue or identify 58 victims, potential victims of human trafficking. This is a new record for you. So is that indicative that this problem is growing worse year after year or? I think it's indicative that we are finding the victims. We have seen, and you have covered for years in the media about the human trafficking problem across the United States and Florida being a vacation state and a sunny state is certainly no exception to that. It is also an attribute to our NGOs because as Chief Parker said, they see them for the long term. If it was a one and done on the night of the arrest, these numbers wouldn't be 58. We'd be lucky if they were three but they continue to follow up and continue to follow up to rescue them. So while I'm totally excited because we've never seen these numbers, the biggest problem we have in this type of investigation is getting the victims to admit they're victims because they're more afraid of their pimps and the human traffickers than they are of the criminal justice system. And it's only through the work of these ladies and their teams that, that's, that, that happens. Yes, ma'am. You said you, you think you know of a woman who, like you just said, was human trafficking and controlling these women. How important is it to you for you to find those people and arrest those people? Oh, absolutely. That is the next wave of this investigation. We know she's Dominican, and we know she is currently in Miami. So if she doesn't get her illegal Dominican butt on a plane and fly back out of this country, we're going to be on her like a good hound dog on a trail. That's a guarantee. Anything else? Thank you. God bless y'all. See you next time.